Hello again, everyone. Let's officially get this party started. Uh, so my name is Colleen Kim Danaher. For those of you who don't know, I am a Presidential Diversity Postdoctoral Fellow in Theater Arts and Performance Studies. Um, and as the principal organizer for this CSREA faculty grant, I want to welcome you to this conversation on comparative racialization and settler colonialism in North America. First of all, I want to thank the campus-wide support networks that made today's event possible, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America, and its fabulous team of Trisha Rose, Caitlin Murphy, and Christina Downs generously provided resources, guidance, and logistical support through, as I mentioned, a CSREA faculty grant. Thanks also to our co-sponsors, the Kogut Center for the Humanities, the Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion, and the Departments of English, American Studies, Theater Arts and Performance Studies, and Modern Culture and Media. And finally, I want to thank my collaborator, English PhD candidate Jennifer Wang, who was instrumental to the planning process throughout. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce today's visiting guest, Professor Aiko Day. Professor Day is an associate professor of English and chair of the program in critical and social thought at Mount Holyoke College. She is also co-chair of the five college Asian Pacific American Studies program. Professor Day's research focuses on the intersection of Asian racialization, indigeneity, and capitalism in North America, exploring such topics as the settler colonial biopolitics of landscape art, the transnational coloniality of Japanese internment in Canada, the US, and Australia, as well as comparative approaches to indigeneity, blackness, and racial formation in Canada and the US. Her articles have appeared in journals such as Critical Ethnic Studies, American Quarterly, Amerasia Journal, and Canadian Literature. And her book, Alien Capital, Asian Racialization and the Logic of Settler Colonial Capitalism, offers a significant contribution, uh, sorry, published by Duke University Press in 2016. Alien Capital offers a significant contribution to scholarship on Asian American racial formation, settler colonial studies, and the emerging field of critical ethnic studies. By re-theorizing the history and logic of settler colonialism through its relationship to Asian racialization. That was one sentence. <laughs> In deft readings of Asian American and Asian Canadian literature and visual culture, anchored by a rigorous engagement with Marx, Day argues that Asians came to personify the abstract and negative dimensions of capital, and in the process, challenges us to think about the racial dynamics of entanglements of land, labor, and capital. Please join me in welcoming Aiko Day. Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank you for all coming. It's so wonderful to be here at Brown. It's actually my first time here. I've heard so much about it from, from people that I know here. Um, but I also want to really thank uh, Colleen Kim Danaher, Christina Downs, Caitlin Murphy, and Jennifer Wang for um, organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to share my work. Um, I also want to thank the seminar participants from earlier today for their really stimulating questions and the discussion that we had earlier today. Um, I'm really honored by your interest and um, engagement. So I thought I would talk a little bit about the origins of the project and um, focus a little bit on some of the visual culture that didn't make it into the book as well as some of the visual culture that did. And I think I need to make sure I have my pointer thing. It's very high tech here at Brown. Um, <laughs> okay, so, um, so the origins of my work on settler colonialism stem from the desire to understand Asian racialization beyond the comparative touchstones of anti-black racism in the US, where the racial content of Asian Americans is understood to be kind of between black and white. Um, as someone from Canada, um, I've always had a hard time with this idea that Asians were sort of in between black and white. Um, in this, in this kind of middle minority theory. So the reason for this difficulty was mainly kind of anecdotal or experiential. 
uh, my adolescence and early childhood, or sorry, not early childhood, uh, adulthood, uh, were marked by uh, First Nations uh, blockades rather than the like rural urban blockades and rather than the urban uprisings um, that mark it now. So um, on the left, sorry, on my right uh, is the Oka crisis, which was a big part of, I think I was in the 10th grade and this was kind of like a big moment for me. And then also the history of, of the blockade, native blockade movement in British Columbia was something that was very formative in my thinking about race and difference and you know, uh, in terms of my own uh, burgeoning consciousness about my uh, Asian-ness. And then of course, this is sort of my c contemporary reality of uh, urban uh, uh, uprisings around anti-black uh, police violence. So by reflecting on this distinction between Canada and the US, um, I'm not trying to minimize the or deny the violence of anti-black racism in Canada. Rather, I just want to acknowledge that the interplay of race and indigeneity has unfolded in different ways uh, there than in the US, and that the legacy of indigenous dispossession has taken on a paradigmatic status in Canada. Can everyone hear me okay? In the back? Okay, good. Um, but dis despite these differences uh, that have shaped the sort of distinct racial and ethnic trajectories in Canada and the US, a notable exception uh, is the racialization of Asian North Americans. So when it comes to Asians, public sentiment and policy in Canada and the United States has really unfolded in lockstep. Uh, from the history of labor recruitment, exploitation, and expulsion of, a of Asian labor, restricted immigration policy, and segregated bachelor enclaves from wartime internment to post-war immigration reform. So my question was like, what can really account for those parallels given the vast differences in US and Canadian racial formation? So if from a broader North American standpoint, um, it, so how do, how do we approach this question if uh, Asian racialization can't be understood as, p as a purely derivative form of anti-black racism? So I wanted to turn to, to settler colonialism for answers. So what this meant was that rather than thinking about the racialization of Asians as being constituted between blackness and whiteness, I wanted to explore Asian racial otherness in relation to indigenous land. So before I proceed, uh, I just want to make a few general, very general, um, broad points about settler colonialism, um, just to distinguish it from many other colonial formations that exist. Um, in particular, franchise colonialism, which is the one that most people are familiar with. So, so settler colonialism is a distinct uh, colonial formation for three main reasons that many people cite. The first is that settlers don't leave. In fact, you know, they're engaged in the project of replacing uh, native peoples. Secondly, settlers primary objective is to acquire land rather than to exploit indigenous labor, um, which is distinct from say, the exploitation of Indian labor in, 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 this, in, in India, it's like in a British franchise colonial situation. So, um, so it's the, the point again here is to replace indigenous labor, uh, or sorry, it, uh, replace native people not to exploit their labor. And the third, uh, which is that settler colonialism is a structure, not an event, to reiterate Patrick Wolfe's often quoted phrase, which means that the dispossession of indigenous people is continuous and never ends. Uh, there is no post-settler post colonialism. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit about some of the romantic settler mythologies that um, I think are part of the uh, cultural uh, uh, projection of settler colonial mythology. And um, one is that uh, there is a kind of, it, as part of settler culture, you have a kind of imperialist nostalgia where um, you know, it kind of makes racial domination appear innocent and pure. Uh, where people mourn the passing of a, or transformation of what they've caused to be transformed. So you have a, a, a kind of identification, a romantic identification with a kind of noble savage figure. Um, a second aspect of the cultural formation of settler colonialism is uh, the practice of going native, where uh, the white man is kind of an ally and displace, displaces the, pos uh, the responsibility for native genocide. So the white man is a kind of super native. Um, and um, so examples of these kinds of, of, of uh, I guess, settler colonial projections are you know, rampant in popular culture, and I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, wrong slide. <laughs> um, I was worried about this, okay, let's see. Oh, okay, well, I, 
Sorry, I apologize that these, this is a PowerPoint presentation that I usually use a different set of slides. So this is, so I will be going back and forth to them. So uh, my apologies for that. But so in, uh, we see here with a paradigmatic example is going native where uh, Kevin Costner, of course, is, becomes the kind of uh, hero of this, uh, of the film in a more um, kind of uh, interplanetary context. You can not only go super native, but you can go super Navi and become um, a full-fledged kind of uh, trans trans transpose yourself into this kind of indigenous personality. And then um, even, I, I think, an another example of a film that most people haven't seen, it's not kind of a bad film, but um, where you have uh, actually indigenous people and cowboys kind of allied together against a technologically superior and I read Asian <laughs> um, uh, invasion, right? And they're t kind of this extractive uh, uh, alien labor force that's, you know, so, so it's kind of like the settlers and indigenous people are kind of um, uh, going, uh, they're opposed to this, uh, this alien formation. So this settler uh, imaginary symbolically uh, alleviates white settler co colonial responsibility for the genocidal dispossession of indigenous peoples while promoting of the romantic fantasy of white settlers' natural affiliation to land. Um, I also just, I, this is something that I was talking about today earlier in terms of my own uh, uh, struggles with this project as a graduate student. But I do want to just mention that when I started this project about 15 years ago, um, the focus on North American settler colonialism was really considered very obscure um, against the more prominent emphases on empire. Uh, U.S. empire at the time, and, and when I started graduate school, Antonio Negri and Michael Hart's book, Empire, had just been published, and so that was what everyone was doing. And so as a result, a lot of people's eyes glazed over when I said settler colonialism, and then they glazed over a second time when I said Canada. <laughs> um, so, uh, so while uh, most people could really readily accept Canada, Australia, that Canada, Australia, and New Zealand were settler colonies, it was harder at that time, actually, to, for people to kind of get on board with this idea that the US was forged out of British colonial processes that were analogous rather than exceptional. But what does, it, I think, distinguish the US as a settler colony is the, in the way that it, it epitomizes a paradigm of endless invasion of both indigenous and foreign lands. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to my D'Souza slide. So as I mentioned, I wanted to give you that little bit of, of some of the origins of the project, but also to look at some of the visual culture that didn't make it in and also did make it into my project. Um, so my book, for even though I do a lot of uh, abstract kind of theoretical work in, in my book, um, there's also a lot of visual culture. There's lots of pictures. <laughs> so if you're interested in pictures, then um, hopefully you'll be interested in, in the project. Um, so the reasons for my project's multimedia focus are twofold. First, um, my engagement with visual culture uh, attempts to grapple with the ideological expression of white settler colonialism and anti-Asian sentiment in North America as a uh, multimedia and particularly visual projection. Secondly, um, the visual works I incorporate respond to Hollywood constructions of Asians that evoke mystery, deception, or inscrutability. The mystery and treachery, often reinforced through the visuality of Asians in popular culture or so in, and in popular media, are distinctive because they always point to something that's invisible or unseen, suggesting that the negative content of Asian racialization is something that we can't visualize. It's abstract. Um, so the visual culture presented in my book kind of offers visual responses by Asian American and Asian Canadian cultural producers who take up the challenge of vi visualizing what is kind of unrepresentable. So there's a lot of, um, and because there's a lot of uh, uh, abstract kind of theoretical um, work in my, in, my, in my book, it's kind of a welcome pleasure now to, to just focus and spend some time offering some reflections on the, on the visual work that's in the book. So this is um, a slide um, that didn't actually, this is a slide of an image that didn't make it in a book, and it's from Alan D'Souza's series, which is entitled Terrain. On first glance, um, D'Souza's piece uh, evokes maybe a southwestern landscape, 
conjuring uh, mythologies of a fabled 19th century uh, frontier. Um, si simultaneously, you can kind of think about how it evokes a heroic tradition of American landscape art from Thomas Cole's spiritually inflected paintings of the northeastern seaboard to Ansel Adams' um, operatic mountainscapes. So Cole and Adams really epitomize a colonial way of seeing, a patriarchal vision of land um, as an idyllic terrain of patriotic nationalism, heroic masculinity, and imperial expansion. But I'll warn you, uh, D'Souza's work is deceptive. Uh, his landscape isn't actually a painting, um, but actually sits on a table as a kind of miniature diorama. Um, the rocks and foliage uh, are constructed out of hair, eyelashes, earwax, dead skin, pubic hair that he collected off of his bathroom floor, which is really gross. Right? <laughs> 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 but, but this is his point. Uh, uh, by, refigu by refiguring and rescaling the landscape as bodily detritus, D'Souza offers a grotesquely queer rethinking of the colonial sublime, where the land's bodily vitality is refigured as the site of colonial decomposition and waste. It is a bodily distortion of nature and, and an assault on our senses. So while my own research is invested in the economic modality of Asian labor in North American settler nations, it also draws on the degenerative, and here the disgusting, to call into question settler mythologies invested in a pure and purifying landscape in the land. Um, and also I think that given D'Souza's relation to post-colonial India as an Asian American artist, um, his work also might represent a kind of transcolonial gesture of solidarity. So examining works like D'Souza's in, Al in Alien Capital, um, uh, my book explores the way Asian North American literature and visual culture rework the economic modalities of Asian racialization from late 19th and early 20th centuries of a natural excessive efficiency to 21st century analogies of Jewish upward mobility and productivity. I argue that the historical alignment of Asian bodies with labor and labor with capitals abstract and ne negative dimensions reflects a logic of settler colonial romantic anti-capitalism in which a romanticization of social life is understood as the natural visible world which is epitomized by the figure of the native that the settler is trying to become and on the other hand rendering invisible abstract anti-natural and non-human the figure of the Asian alien. Um, I push beyond existing approaches to settler colonialism as simply a native settler binary in order to theorize settler colonialism as a dynamic triangulation of native settler and alien positionalities. My book's transnational frame draws on corresponding racial policy making in the US and Canada at key historical turning points from Chinese uh, railroad labor uh, in the 19th century to the late 1960s neoliberalization of immigration policy. So um, in exploring, uh, in addition to exploring Asians' alien relation to indigenous land, uh, this project also grew out of the question of why Asians were symbolically associated with negative forms of capital and how this related more broadly to settler colonialism in North America. And so this brings me to the slide of the new-ish new uh, Canadian $100 bill and the controversy that erupted around it in 2012 when the Bank of Canada um, issued a public apology for purging the image of an Asian female scientist from the face. So, um, uh, so based on internal reports obtained by the Canadian pr press, the decision to remove the Asian scientist came in response to focus groups who previewed the design and, and felt that her a Asian appearance did not re represent Canada. Um, so although the bank never actually released the original design, I would you know, kill to see it, um, a spokesperson indicated that the image of a Caucasian looking woman was substituted to, quote, restore neutral ethnicity, unquote. <laughs> um, another, you know, interesting uh, I, uh, definition of whiteness. So news of the, you know, of the bank's decision obviously uh, met a lot of criticism from Asian advocacy groups, particularly the Chinese Canadian National Council, who criticized the bank and urged it to stop erasing visible minorities from Canada's money. 
And even US blogger uh, Phil Angry Asian Man, you, some of you might know, follow his blog, uh, weighed in on what you know he called, uh, he, well, he weighed in on those who called attention to the stereotypical nature of, you know, if they had put this Asian scientist up, you know, they said, well, that would have been so stereotypical. But he kind of retorts, you know, sure, there's a stereotype of Asians excelling in math or science, but let's be real. The reason why people didn't want an Asian looking woman on a hundred dollar bill is because an Asian looking woman couldn't possibly represent a face of Canada. Thus, the, to the rush to redesign her with more Caucasian features. So for angry Asian men and countless others, the controversy's significance turns on the variable race of the scientist against the assumed stability of the money form of capital as a representation of nation. So to, to restore the Asian looking characteristics to the scientists would, by extension, restore equilibrium between race and nation. But to me, what seemed to be missing from uh, this, discussion, this, this discussion uh, was a pe peculiar intersection of race and money, of race as a form of money, or vice versa. And also, as an aside, uh, in the US context, it strikes me that also what's been missing from discussions about um, the, dis you know, the decision to add Harriet Tubman's uh, face to the $20 bill is the disturbing irony of using an ex-slave to personify a fungible commodity mm -hmm. in light of our national history, founded on what Sadia Hartman identifies as the fungibility of blackness. So for me, the controversy over the $100 bill exposes the ways that Asians were uncomfortably, are uncomfortably associated with capital, revealing an economic modality that linked constructions of the Asian and the Jew, um, giving new meaning to the label given to Asian Americans as the new Jews. And obviously, um, the new Jews is meant sort of as a compliment. <laughs> uh, or it's supposed to be like a, it's meant in a congratulatory sense that's supposed to recognize the increasing affluence and assimilation of a historically excluded minority. So even though the new Jews is supposed to be a positive label to reference Asian immigrant success, my research focuses on strictly the negative side of the new Jews association and specifically how Asians like Jews before them have come to personify a negative form of capital or bad money. In particular, the Asian Jewish analogy compels a recognition of the economic context of an modern anti-Semitism as distrust or disdain of Jews, which can sometimes be motivated by envy or resentment of an identifiably separate group that's significantly wealthier than the population at large. So the economic conflation of Asians and Jews also has its own history. It's uh, quite a long history. Um, uh, that Jonathan Friedman has looked at, and he's noted that like Jews, Chinese merchants were traditionally, who were traditionally active through, throughout East and Southeast Asia faced, like Jews, resentment, discrimination, and even the occasional pogrom as a result. Intersecting expressions of industriousness, greed, and evil have been infused in popular culture representations of both groups in Europe and North America, from novelist George de Maurier's 1895 creation of the Je Jewish descendant Svengali to novelist Sax Romer's 1921 invention of Fu Manchu. Both characters are perverse, evil geniuses who aspire to world domination. The Canadian uh, $100 bill controversy is a heightened expression of this economy, uh, economism of racial form, insofar as the dehumanized economism of the Asian simultaneously represents the personification of capitalism. So what precedes the uh, economism of Asian racial form is the so similarly destructive economism historically attributed to Jews, highlighting more of the, the more disturbing kind of registers of the new Jews label. Moishipa Stone uh, focuses on the secular elements of anti-Semitism that flourished under national socialism in Germany, illustrating a historical process by which Jews became associated with the abstract evils of capitalism. Because Jews had long been segregated in finance and interest sector uh, generating sectors of European society, traditional anti-Semitism identified Jews as owners of money. Uh, perhaps the most notorious literary example of this is, um, the, you know, uh, is Shakespeare's Shylock, who is kind of, depending on which version you see of it, which production you see, is, you know, the sinister or kind of uh, sympathetic user in The Merchant of Venice whose penalty for late payment is nothing short of a pound of flesh. 
However, by the 19th century, modern anti-Semitism not only identified Jews as the owners of money, but held them responsible for economic crises not um, uh, in a range of, whole, of social restructuring and dislocation res re resulting from rapid industrialization. In short, as Postone explains, quote, Jews became the personification of the intangible, destructive, immensely powerful, and international domination of capital as a social form. And I have a couple of posters, propaganda posters from the, uh, from the World War II era, but um, the, the one on the right is uh, in Russian, and I think it's, it says, um, in whose interest is the current war? It's in the Jews' interest. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, nations fight and die for them, and they, the Jews, make a profit of it. And I think that the image on the, my right is on my, the rightest one, I guess the most left one for you, is interesting because it's turning things like human beings into money. <laughs> and so that's literally this kind of transformation of something concrete into something abstract. <coughs> um, and then um, in the French poster on the right uh, is uh, the Jew is behind everything. So this idea that this war is happening, but Jews are sort of organizing it and profiting from it. Uh, so here are the attributes of abstractness, int intangibility, universality, uh, mobility that are associated with Jews are striking to me in their resonance with characteristic forms of Asian racialization in North America. The racial signifiers of inscrutability, perpetual foreignness, transnational ability, and flexibility similar similarly register the abstract features of Asian racialization that I align, I align sorry, with the evolution of settler colonial capitalism in North America. So in the manner that Jews came to personify processes internal to finance capital under national socialism, I argue that the Asian subject in North America personifies abstract processes of value formation anchored by labor. From the economic efficiency associated with Asian racialization, denigrated as cheap labor in the 19th century and valued as efficient in the 21st, Asian North American cultural production magnifies the manner through which Asians are aligned with abstract labor, a concept that anchors Marx's labor theory of value. Um, and I'm just going to pause here for a moment to elaborate a bit more on this connection between race and abstract labor. Um, in particular, uh, by emphasizing the category of abstract labor, my project diverges from the important work of scholars like Lisa Lowe, uh, David Rodiger, and others who've argued that capitalism has profited by not <laughs> rendering it abstract, but actually uh, produce, uh, but by producing racialized difference. Uh, for instance, in Lisa Lowe's critique of the labor theory of value, she hones in on Marx's homogenizing de definition of abstract labor to demonstrate that capital has profited from the specifically gendered and racialized character of labor, qualities that are far from indistinguishable or abstract. Um, in short, she writes, quote, Asian immigrants and Asian Americans have been neither abstract labor nor abstract citizens, unquote. David Rodiger extends this line of argument, asserting that far from flattening difference by buying undifferentiated units of labor time, US management studiously bought into inequality, preserving and continually recreating race, unquote. So while my project is absolutely in harmony with the claim that capitalism produces racialized difference, I propose that these differentiating effects are not actually in contradiction with Marx's formulation of abstract labor. What is missing from Lowe's and Rodiger's critiques of abstract labor is the recognition, recognition of its dialectical relation to concrete labor. Co concrete labor represents the racial, gendered, and qualitatively distinct form of actual labor that is rendered abstract as a value expression. Where I lo the locate the principal violence of capitalism is in the very way it abstracts or renders homogenous as commensurable units of labor, highly differentiated, gendered, and racialized labor in order to create value. It is therefore the law of value that obscures the racial and gendered character of labor power. For value itself is what necessitates what we could characterize as a metaphoric process of turning particular labor into quantifiable units of abstract labor. So in response to the suggestion that racialization is irreducible to the conception of abstract labor because of its gendered and racial particularity, no value would be produced if this were the case. Rather, all commodity-determined labor plays 
a socially mediating role that is structured by time. Capital, capital maximizes profit by controlling time, socially necessary labor time. So nothing prevents the exploitation of racial and gendered labor from being a social necessity that determines average labor time. Um, indeed, one of the core, one, one core logic of the settler colonial mode of production I explore centers on the systemic um, exploitation of racialized, gendered, and, sex and sexualized alien labor force. Uh, the structuring role of time is precisely the reason that capitalism is an abstract form of domination, what Petrus Lee characterizes as impersonal domination. This doesn't mean that we don't, bear da we don't daily bear witness to the brutal working conditions or the near enslavement of racialized and gender labor. Rather, the very violence of labor abstraction is what subsumes the horrors of highly differentiated labor into an abstracted quantity that is commensurable with all other things. It is the duplicity of value as a social relation that Marx denounces. To put it another way, we don't control the products of our labor, we are controlled by the products of our labor. Um, therefore, while I agree that capitalism produces racialized difference, my, my book defines social differentiation as a form of destructive abstraction anchored by a settler colonial ideology of romantic anti-capitalism. Okay, so to recap, <laughs> I know that was a lot to digest, sorry. Uh, my book's primary thesis, again, is that Asian North American literature and visual culture present a genealogy of settler colonialism that magnifies a key logic of romantic anti-capitalism that misperceives capital relations as an opposition of concrete and abstract realms. Inspired by the aesthetic dimensions of romanticism that glorified the natural world as a spiritual refuge from the corruptions of capitalist modernity, romantic anti-capitalism glorifies the concrete over the abstract dimensions. It glorifies the real, the natural, the thingly, the pure, the sensory. Uh, native peoples, who are characterized as existing outside of time and money often place, oftentimes, personify that concrete dimension. Asian aliens, on the contrary, are a kind of biological expression of the abstract dimension, the personification of the destructive uh, abstraction of capitalist modernity. And evocations of this kind of romantic um, anti-capitalism are, you know, uh, common, I think, in American culture, or they're actually per pervasive from you know, Henry David Thoreau's excursion to Walden Pond to live without material comforts, um, to the feature films I've mentioned, which characters kind of go native, uh, but also even I'm thinking of Chris McCandless, who, in, you know, he went to live, you know, he burnt, set fire to his cash, basically, to live in the Alaska wilderness, and so there is this kind of idea that you need to rid yourself of this, of this modernity, and so th those are, and actually burning your cash will not do anything to halt capitalism, so don't, <laughs> don't try that. <laughs> um, anyways, okay, so as a, as a counterpoint to the romantic identification with indigenous peoples, with the concrete uh, qualitative sphere of anti-capitalism is, um, again, the association of Asian laborers with the abstract quantitative sphere of capitalism. All right, so we've been here already. Okay, so... Um, so I'm going to now turn, so those are the big sort of claims that I try to make in terms of thinking about settler colonialism, romantic anti-capitalism, and abstract labor. And, and now I'm going to kind of turn to just give you a little bit of an overview of the chapters in the book. Um, so I'd like to begin with this sketch uh, from the 1880s by William Van Horn. Um, he was the general manager of the Canadian Pacific Railway. Um, it, I, I like to show this image as much as possible because I was not given permission <laughs> to, to actually uh, re reproduce it in my book mm -hmm. because the CPR, uh, you know, the Canadian Pacific Railroad, they're assholes. <laughs> 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 and they said that um, this image, which has actually been reproduced elsewhere, they said that it tarnished the reputation of the general manager, the fact that he has like uh, drawn um, an image, I guess, like a profile of a Chinese laborer somehow they thought would tarnish his reputation. So, <laughs> um, so in my, I still have a reading of the sketch, however, <laughs> in, in my book, but in my reading, what I, I, I focus on, so we have a profile of a Chinese worker and then he's, and then he's surrounded by all these um, like mathematical calculations. And so I draw in the way that evokes, 
the relation between the concrete and the abstract, the concrete specificity of the racialized labor and abstract, the abstract universal equivalence of money. And in particular, I look at how Van Horn's um, sketch kind of evokes the idea of racialized labor as a form of money. And I kind of have a reading of just how the tally marks and um, the way in which his mustache, or there, there's a kind of rhyming <laughs> element in just the visual, uh, the aesthetics of the, of the image. Um, so I sort of think about how, how money and racialized labor can kind of exist in a kind of substitution relationship. So um, I argue that this is a form of racialized substitution that kind of establishes my book's primary claim that the economism of Asian racialization arises from an alignment of Chinese bodies with time, which is the basis of value. Uh, this establishes the relation between Chinese labor as a personification of abstract labor, which represents a social average of quantified labor time. So following the co completion of the transcontinental railroad, Chinese bodies increasing become increasingly associated with degeneracy and vice that become the mark of their excessive efficiency. This temporal excess is rooted in the social deprivations of Chinese domesticity and civic life that render Chinese labor both non-human and also a threat to the qualitative value of white labor. So analyzing two works um, about Chinese labor on the transcontinental railroad, I focus on the range of uh, gender and sexual substitutions rep represented in Richard Fung's Dirty Laundry, A History of Heroes. Uh, which is a Canadian film, experimental film, alongside Ma Maxine Hong Kingston's Chinaman. I argue that these works demonstrate how the abstract racialization of Asian alien labor is, is, aligned, sorry, is established through their alignment with a perverse temporality. While Fung's and Kingston's work expose the fungibility of alien labor conditioned by biolog biologized notions of time, they also point to the queer potential of Dipesh Chakrabarti's concept of history, too, that resides within abstract labor but does not reproduce the logic of capitalism. Uh, my second chapter turns its attention to the concrete dimension of capitalist social relations personified in artistic depictions of the settler landscape. So analyzing the photographs of Sen Kuang Chi, which is the bigger black and white um, photograph, and Jin and Yoon, who's, um, this is like sort of the front and back view of this huge uh, slide, or th this huge um, series of photographs that she's done. Um, I argue that their photographic citations of 1920s and 1930s era landscape art parody its romanticization of whiteness as nature, as a form of nature, during a heightened period of Asian immigrant restriction. In particular, Sang and Yoon respond to themes of regenerative whiteness an identification with indigeneity that are personified in the majestic landscapes by an, uh, American artist Ansel Adams and Gutsum Borglum, and Canadian artists Emily Carr and the Group of Seven. Disidentifying with the romanticization of the concrete purifying landscape, Tsang's and Yoon's photographs expose the politics of whiteness uh, invested in the identification with nature and indigeneity. Further developing the theme of perversity associated with abstract labor that I developed in the first chapter, um, I also, um, looking at Sang and Yoon's photographs, I highlight how Asian bodies evolved to denote a degenerative anti-natural force associated with the abstract dimensions of romantic anti-capitalism. In my third chapter, I move to an examination of Japanese internment in Canada and the US. This slide features uh, one of Ruth Asawa's hanging sculptures, which to me evokes an alien landscape, kind of the opposite of the landscapes that are in the second chapter, um, conjuring a kind of inverted forest growing downward into an underworld. It is quite literally yeah, the, uh, the opposite of a patriarchal vision of the settler landscape. Her hanging sculptures provide a motif of negative space, which uh, Asawa describes as a shape that is inside and outside at the same time. Her tied wire sculptures offer a visualization of dialectical process, holding both concrete and abstract, hard and soft, inside and outside, mechanical and organic intention, while evoking a bodily form that recalls a kind of memory, what she calls, quote, those things your body doesn't allow you to leave behind, 
unquote. So Asawa's arts, Asawa's arts abstract qualities provide a framework for my analysis of Joy Kagawa's novel Obasan and Ria Tajiri's film History and Memory, where I explore aspects of Japanese internment in North America that defy concrete representation, elements that contribute to the way Japanese internment can never be fully compartmentalized in the past, but rather lives on as a haunting excess that persists as post-memory. So in this chapter, I argue that before the war, uh, the excessive efficiency attributed to Japanese agriculture and fishing labor in the United States and Canada contributed to the false impression that Japanese labor held a destructive control over the production of relative surplus value. In particular, the association of Japanese labor with the modernizing displacements of technological innovation fed a perception that Japanese labor monopolized the creation of relative surplus value. That's the value above and beyond surplus value. So I examine how the destructive power of Japanese labor mutated following West Coast expulsion and relocation. Uh, focusing on Kogawa's novel and, and Tajiri's video memoir, I examine how symbolic identification with Jewish persecution before the war shifted toward an identification with native identities after relocation. This cross-racial identification with native context evokes the neutralization and renaturalization of Japanese labor, labor's threatening association with the production of unnatural value. So following relocation, Japanese labor is reconstituted as an ideal surplus labor force through the symbolic and spatial proximity to native relocation and dispossession. Um, my fourth chapter uh, examines the persisting and evolving economism of Asian racialization in the post-immigrant uh, restriction era, or the post-exclusion era, after the United States and Canada removed race-based immigration criteria in 1965 and 1967, respectively. So this slide is meant to um, a signal like the resentment towards monster houses in Vancouver. Um, uh, and so you can see that there's a huge house <laughs> right beside the small house. And, and, um, uh, and so there's a lot of anti-Asian racism around the construction of these, of these kinds of homes. Um, so uh, in this chapter, I look at, uh, I focus on Ken Lum's multimedia works along with Karen Tay Mashida's novel, Tropic of Orange, tracking, tracking their reconceptualizations of labor, labor migration and neoliberal identity politics. Their works um, point to the capacity of the neoliberal border to recruit and restrict surplus labor populations from around the world while preserving the racialized abstractions that surround both high-tech, flexible Asian labor and working class and poor labor. As such, free trade becomes a further conduit for the fungibility of bodies as capital across borders and the continuing perils, perils associated with the new Jew. Far, far from symbolizing multicultural inclusion, I suggest that the border is a central motor for the expanded fulfillment of a settler colonial mode of production that relies on a disposable migrant labor system. Um, and so I'm gonna take a moment to, I'll come back to this image, I think. I, this could, yeah, I'll come back to this image, but um, I'll just uh, talk a little bit more about the artist Ken Lam, which many of you probably aren't familiar with necessarily, um, and I'll just spend some time talking about him. Uh, so Lung, Ken Lum is a, is a um, Cana Chinese Canadian artist uh, who is often associated with the Vancouver Photo Conceptual <coughs> School. Um, he is a student of Jeff Walls. Um, and as a multimedia artist, I think he offers a really interesting vision of Vancouver. And uh, it's often very unsentimental, kind of sort of darkly humorous. And he often incorporates ideas about borders, labor, um, and the city of Vancouver in particular, as a place that really epitomizes the contradictions of neoliberal multiculturalism. So here's an example of his furniture sculpture series. And while they don't really immediately <laughs> seem to be about borders, um, what's interesting about them is that um, there's actually no way to use them as furniture. As you notice, like the red circle, there's no way to actually access the interior <laughs> of the sofa, right, to sit on it. <laughs> Um, similarly, in this kind of uh, cheesy sort of hotel lobby formation down here, there's no, all the, the sofas are so closely kind of locked together that you can actually, again, sit down. So 
And then I think most uh, dramatically is in many ways the, uh, the sofa bed that's kind of been opened out, but yet it's against the corner so you can't actually sit down. And, and in particular, a sofa bed is something that you, you, uh, you, know, you take the bed out when someone's visiting you, right? So, so you get, so it, in, in all of these, um, these uh, works, you kind of get this idea of exclusion, right? You can't sit down, or sort of a thwarted, a thwarted hospitality. Um, or an excluded temporary visitor. And so I think that it does actually, together they do kind of offer an interesting allegory of the border. So if we shift away from these, so he had, he's a multimedia artist, so he also has, has this interesting, um, these uh, portrait attribute uh, uh, works as well. So this one is called Nancy Nishi and Joe King Chow Real Estate. Um, and so in this one, I think he offers an alternative view of Asian ra racialization against the more familiar scene of Vancouver's cosmopolitanism. The high rise apartments that populate the photographs background are a signifier of the city's alias as Hongcouver. The name, which is kind of used in both celebratory and pejorative contexts, stems from the significant Chinese population in Vancouver, as well as the city's purported architectural, cultural, and economic resemblance to Hong Kong. So redirecting a pop, pop emphasis on exaggerated artifice, in Nancy uh, Nishi and Joe Ping Chow real estate, Lum's advertising motif almost works too well. I mean, if you saw this, you might actually think it's actually an ad, right, <laughs> for uh, this real estate. So removed from the art gallery context, which is another thing he does, he often puts these, these huge billboards outside of the gallery. Um, the only element that kind of uh, alerts us to its status as art is the real estate part. <laughs> which is kind of in this, um, has a kind of Flintstones quality to it. <laughs> <laughs> so the unrealistic veneer of the lettering kind of humorously underscores the realness of real estate, in addition to in the contrasting relation between image and text, between the concrete buildings in the background um, in the photograph and the abstract textual representation of buildings as real estate commodities, we can make out a subtle reference to the antinomy of concrete and abstract dimensions of romantic anti-capitalism. Here, the abstract representation of concrete real estate is reduced to a comically in an inadequate imitation of actual concrete buildings. Yet at another level, the portrait of Nancy Nishi and Zhou Ping Chao adds to the more racially ominous registers of the friction between image and text. Their relation to the Flintstones real estate logo adds an air of illegitimacy and artifice to the earnest expressions that they bring to their professional endeavor. On the one hand, this sense of illegitimacy broadcasts their artificial relation to property. Their belonging is rendered a mere abstract signifier against a more concrete sense of citizenship. On the other hand, um, the artificial concreteness of their profession as realtor, realtors also allegorizes an anti-Asian animosity stemming from the perception that Vancouver has been overrun by Hong Kong real estate investors, which is kind of about the monster house image that I showed at the beginning. For, in, uh, for example, Kat Catherine Mitchell notes that in Vancouver, Hong Kong Chinese are perceived as responsible for house price escalation as a result of using homes for profit through the price, uh, sorry, through the practice of speculation rather than as using them as places to live. Although the roots of the city's demographic shifts and spatial reconfigurations are the result of state-led efforts to expedite Vancouver's integration into the global economy, the racial outcome of these processes has effectively reinforced the perception that Asians re represent pure market rationality. Their desires represent the psychology of capitalist expansion. Asian investors and business immigrants have only economic rather than human motivations. By contrast, for white Vancouver residents, as Mitchell also points out, purchasing homes secures profit yet does not have to be pursued as profit. The personification of capitalism that renders Asians less human, removed from the concrete associations that align whiteness with property and belonging, sorry, or less human, so it aligns whiteness with property and belonging, in contrast, so. As such, Nancy Nishi and Joe Ping Chow real estate evokes the form of racial anxiety associated with the abstract sphere of foreign investment and real estate speculation. In this light, the celebratory discourse of legislated multiculturalism functions as a screen hiding the fact that the infusion of Asian foreign investment and rise of Asian migration to North America underscores the abstract economic rationality that is mapped onto the Asian body. 
through the substitution of economic desirability for racial desirability, which still continues to exclude the racialized migrant poor um, in immigration reform, we can see how the Asian embodiment of economic extraction once again threatens the concrete human values invested in traditional white settler belonging rather than flexible citizenship. In response, Lum's work exposes the contradictions of multicultural belonging by disidentifying with the visual tropes of multicultural inclusion in his depictions of Asian working class and professional labor. So I'm just going to um, close with some brief points in relation to a newer artist that I've discovered in the process of writing this book. Um, and he is the Vancouver-born and currently London-based artist Tommy Ting. Um, so um, I was writing my book and I was struggling with how to end it. And, um, and my mother told me about seeing an exhibition featuring Tommy Ting's, uh, which kind of gave me like the, uh, an idea about how I could finish the book. <laughs> and um, so, so, it's, so the, the reason I, I was interested in Tommy Ting's work is this is, this is a, on the, this image is of, of uh, it's, it's called the Iron Chink. It's in the uh, museum in my hometown, Victoria, BC. It's in the Royal British Columbia Museum. And basically what it is, is, is a fish cutting machine. Um, and you can see in my terrible photograph of it, but you can see the actual letters iron chink at the top of it. Um, and um, it was invented in the early 20th century, and it was kind of named for the Chinese butchery crews it replaced in salmon canneries along the Pacific, um, the Pacific coast. And so, in light of the arguments in my book, um, the Iron Chink, you know, evokes the dehumanized abstraction of Asians as machines, but also evokes the way Asians as machines are designed to cut human labor time, which is a threat to white workers. So, um, Tommy Ting's piece is called um, Machine. And then he has a, he has a reference to um, the actual Iron Chink. And he says, oh, it's invented in 1903, found at the Gulf of Georgia Cannery in Steveston, British Columbia re refabricated in Beijing, China. So I actually like to think of his piece as a kind of monstrously reanimated <laughs> Asian Frankenstein, retelling, rebelling, sorry, I should say, against its creator with all of its kind of China red attitude. So part of the dark comedy of Ting's piece lies in how it perfectly embodies the dehumanized abstraction that I tied to Asian racialization throughout my book. In its shiny new, shiny new modern form, machine not only evokes the continuing metaphorization of Asian labor, but also dramatizes its ongoing allure through its vibrant China red color. In its seductive appeal, machine hyperbolizes the sexualization of, Chinese female, the, of the Chinese female migrant who was subject to the 1875 page law, the uh, United States' fir first federal immigration law designed to bar entry to Chinese women based on their presumed sexual immorality. In this light, as a feminized Asian Frankenstein, Machine stands as an ironic invocation of the sexualized and racialized migrant system so central to the settler colonial mode of capitalist reproduction. But equally, Machine's China red paint clearly evokes the color of communism. On the one hand, uh, the China red color cheerfully promotes the communist ideal of collective ownership over the means of production. And on the other, the color alludes to communism's association with the mechanization of human labor. But the reality is that machine remains, at the end of the day, a commodity whose value is commensurable and thus exchangeable with all other commodities. As the monstrous personification of dehumanized equivalence, Asian Frankenstein expresses the contradiction between the value of human beings and their exchangeability as equivalence. And then my last, very last slide. Uh, which is the cover of my book, is also a, p a work by Tommy Ting. Um, so elaborating on the relation between Asian labor as an expression of the fungibility, uh, of fungibility, sorry, is the image I use on the cover of my book, which features a piece called Workers Posing as Workers by Tommy Ting. Um, and so what you can't really tell from the cover is that um, it's actually one of these, on the right, it's a, sorry, I apologize for the blurry photograph, but it's actually one of those um, cardboard, or sorry, wooden structures where you can stick your head through the holes where the faces are. <laughs> um, and, and so it kind of obviously powerfully engages with this idea of the fungibility of Asian alien labor. So like a kind of currency, Asian labor is subject to endless substitution and quantification 
was, which is itself a crucial feature of capitalist abstraction. So to close, if abstraction is ultimately uh, tied to value production, making things commensurable for exchange, my book draws out the racial implications of that metaphoric process while initiating a call for the radical incommensurability of life and labor in the allied struggle for historical self-determination for racialized aliens and indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thank you.